Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Institute for Government. Welcome to everyone here in person and those of you joining us online. I'm Hannah White, and I'm director of the Institute for Government, and I'm delighted to welcome you here today for this keynote speech by Yvette Cooper, MP, who is, of course, Shadow Secretary of State uh, for the Home Office, uh, Shadow Home Secretary, indeed. And Yvette is going to be talking to us today about how Labour would approach uh, crime and policing and running the Home Office. We'll be live tweeting from IFG events using the hashtag IFG Home Office, uh, so please follow along if you wish to. Uh, we'll have a video and sound recording on our website very shortly after the event, and if you're watching online, please do start sending in your questions via Slido. Of course, Yvette needs very little introduction, but is, uh, has of course been Labour MP uh, since 1997, and before her appointment as Shadow Home Secretary, uh, she was Chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, and in government, she served as Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Chief Secretary to the Treasury and Housing Minister. So I'm sure we're all very interested to hear what Yvette has to say to us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah, and thank you to the IFG for hosting me today. Thank you, too, to all of you for coming this morning. Um, can I also just start by always welcoming the work that the Institute for Government does uh, through thick and thin to promote better government. And boy, do we need that right now. And I welcome to pay tribute to the work of the IFG Academy, who offer advice and support to every newly appointed cabinet minister and minister as they start their new job also had a very busy 12 months with hundreds of newly appointed or reappointed reshuffled ministers in the last 12 months alone we've had four home secretaries two of whom were the same person three justice secretaries two of whom were the same person three attorney generals and four policing ministers and it is a shocking level of chaos and it's damaging but it's not just the chaos and the incompetence that has caused the problems around issues around crime and policing so i want to talk today about what's been a complete collapse in home office leadership on crime and policing under the conservatives how they've stood back while neighborhood policing has crumbled while the charge rate has plummeted while confidence and policing and the criminal justice system have fallen, while more victims are being let down and more criminals are getting off. And I want to set out the very different Labour approach that Keir Starmer and I and the Labour Shadow Cabinet are taking and show why only Labour is the party of law and order now. If you talk to people across the country about their experiences of crime, policing and the criminal justice system, you'll hear countless stories of frustration and anger. Too often, there is a sense that when things go wrong, no one comes and nothing is done. Too often, as in so many other public services, after 13 years of Conservative government, everything feels broken. So I've heard from shop owners and residents who are sick and tired of nothing being done about rising crime and antisocial behaviour in their town centres that is dragging the area and the local economy down. I've heard from a taxi driver who told me about the local taxi rank being pelted routinely with stones by a small group of teenagers but nothing being done. An older woman who told me that she didn't shop in town anymore because the street drinkers made her say, un feel unsafe and she never saw the police and a store manager who said they'd been burgled three times in the space of a fortnight, and even though they thought they knew who was responsible, no one had been to be able to see the CCTV. Policing is overstretched, but rising crime and antisocial behaviour in town centres is corroding the local social and economic fabric, and the police patrols have been cut back. I've heard too from parents deeply worried about what's happening to children and teenagers, about them being bullied or harassed, in the street, threatened with violence or drawn into crime or being targeted or groomed online. And they're also worried, most of all, that if things start going wrong for their family, there will be no one to turn to or no one to help. We lost two more young lives to violence, terrible violence this week, in Cheshire and in Chelmsford. And knife crime has gone up by 70% since 2015, with some of the biggest increases in the suburbs and in small towns, Yet early intervention services have been cut back 
And again, too little is being done. And I've heard from pensioners worried not just about antisocial behaviour on the streets, but about being targeted with scams and online fraud. And fraud nearly accounts now for nearly half of all crime, yet barely any of those crimes are actually investigated, and less than 0.1% of them make it to court. So hardly anything is being done. And all of us have spoken to women who are fed up of holding their keys between their fingers as they walk home in the dark, who are weary of having to worry about whether their drink is being spiked, and who are angry that so little is done to support them or get them justice when things go wrong. Today, across the country, 300 women are likely to be raped. 200 of those rapes will be reported, but barely three of those rapists will be convicted. So let that disgraceful fact sink in. Shamefully little is being done. And remember how much more angry everyone feels to see that basic standards of behaviour towards women haven't even been enforced within the very police forces who are supposed to protect us from violence. Over the last 30 years, traditional volume crimes like robbery and burglary have fallen. As new technology, like home alarms, car anti-theft devices have made a huge difference, and that is really welcome. But as long as people feel that in important areas like knife crime or town centre antisocial behaviour, things are getting worse, and as long as people feel that vital public services won't protect them or deliver justice, then confidence will fall and the sense of public frustration and anger will grow. After 13 years of Conservative government, Fewer crimes are being solved, fewer criminals are being caught. There will be around 7,000 thefts today in England and Wales, of which around 4,000 will be reported. Only 180 will face court. Since 2010, under the Conservatives, we've seen arrests halved, prosecutions halved, convictions halved, community penalties halved, court delays at record highs, and record numbers of victims giving up on the criminal justice system and dropping out. And the prosecution rate has plummeted by a shocking two-thirds since 2015, with only one in 20 recorded crimes now charged. So quite literally, that means more criminals are getting away with it after 13 years of Conservative government. And the Home Secretary is doing nothing to turn that around. Then that collapse in prosecution started in 2015. Successive Home Secretaries have just shrugged their shoulders and failed to act. On policing, the Home Secretary is absent too. Across the country, I have met dedicated and brave police officers who are doing a brilliant job to keep people safe. Neighbourhood officers and PCSIOs I spoke to yesterday in Milton Keynes, who are working incredibly hard to tackle knife crime, which has risen sharply in the area. Response officers that I've spoken to in Yorkshire, who risk their own lives to stop a dangerous machete attacker or the detectives in Merseyside I spoke to, working night and day to solve and investigate homicide and organised crime. But for all that dedication and hard work, public confidence in policing has fallen, and according to some surveys, by 20% in just two years. Forces are facing growing and more complex demands, but they have fewer resources and badly inadequate uh, policies to help them cope. Austerity has been a double whammy for them, the 20,000 officers and thousands more PCSOs and staff that were cut, but other cuts hitting, public, hitting policing too, for example in prevention, probation, prosecutors, youth services, drug and alcohol treatment, social care, the NHS, all run into the ground, and policing picks up the pieces when other services fail. So mental health demand on policing has shot up, and sadly you will often see Police officers set, sat waiting for hours trying to get serious mental health patients admitted before they hurt themselves or someone else, picking up the pieces for the strain in the NHS. At the same time, crime has become more complex, whether that be dealing with rising fraud or online evidence in abuse cases, but policing technology and practice hasn't kept up. The police national computer, the once state-of-the-art technology and ahead of the game, is an unbelievable 50 years old next year. Digital forensics is a total nightmare. Officers are spending hours more on bureaucracy, especially if they want to lay charges, 
One officer I spoke to said he now spends 12 hours preparing the same case file that would have taken him just two hours two years ago. And there's huge workforce problems, a major shortage of detectives, many officers feeling badly overstretched and unsupported, while training and recruitment processes are inadequate. As the truly shocking cases of David Carrick and Wayne Cousins have shown, vetting standards and misconduct systems have badly failed. None, neither of those men should ever have been police officers or able to serve for so long. But systems to root out racism, misogyny, homophobia, and toxic bullying culture are nowhere near strong enough, letting victims, communities, and policing down. And confidence has fallen further in black communities too. All this is deeply damaging, but again, where is the Home Secretary's plan to turn this round? Where's the action to upgrade police technology or deliver a proper national workforce strategy? Why isn't anyone showing national leadership to sort out the really wasteful lack of coordination between 43 forces on shared services, technology, procurement? Where's the plan for a new standards regime? Why, why did the Home Office not act after the awful murder of Sarah Everard when everyone demanded change? And why isn't the Home Secretary working with the Health Secretary on reducing mental health pressures or with the Education Secretary on plans to prevent still rising knife crime? It's a dereliction of duty and the Conservatives are missing in action in the fight against crime. But I want to talk about what underpins this, because it's not just about one Home Secretary. For 13 years, the Conservatives deliberately ran a hands-off Home Office, failing to take proper action on serious areas of rising crime, failing to introduce serious policing reform. Conservatives' ministers obviously made the decisions to hit policing, prosecution and the courts hard with austerity, which caused deep damage to those services. But then they also walked away. Under David Cameron and Theresa May, the Conservatives made a strategic decision to withdraw the Home Office from active policies on policing and crime and to leave everything instead to a very fragmented network of local forces, PCCs and weak national policing institutions. And successive Home Secretaries have made the same, maintained the same approach ever since. It has been a laissez-faire approach that in practice has let communities down. So they abandoned the work that the Home Office used to do on police standards, on workforce planning, on crime prevention, on anticipating new and changing patterns of crime. And they ditched partnership working with other, leaders, with other departments or agencies, even where that national leadership is needed. That's why there's no proper national workforce plan or why technology is in such chaos. And they've totally failed to deliver a policing and justice system fit for the 2020s. There's no sense of direction or urgency about the challenges policing and communities face. The too often, all well, there's been from the Conservative Home Secretaries is rhetoric. The talk is tough, but the walk is woefully weak and the Conservatives are weak on crime and on its causes too. The, the action, or shall we say inaction, reflects deliberate decisions, but also a deep-rooted set of values. It reflects the Conservative belief in a smaller government, an inactive government, their lack of commitment to public services, and a sense of walking away from their responsibility for what happens in communities or whether justice is delivered, leaving people to sink or swim alone. And it reflects a shocking carelessness that the Conservative Party has shown in recent years about respect for the rule of law itself. And I don't think they get how damaging this has become because confidence in policing and the criminal justice system is increasingly fragile. And for some people, that is hanging only by a thread. And it matters. It threatens our British policing model, our policing by consent, if confidence is not maintained, undermines the respect for the rule of law, which underpins our very democracy and the safety of our communities, if just people think that justice won't be done, and it corrodes our communities if public spaces are downgraded and people don't feel safe. So that's why Labour will take a fundamentally different approach. In the Labour Party, we believe in championing social justice. You don't get social justice if you are denied justice and you don't feel safe. We want Britain to be a country in which everyone can enjoy new opportunities 
but security is the foundation on which all other opportunities are built. Strong communities are safe communities. And that's why we believe in upholding the law, standing up for justice, and cracking down on the criminals who destroy people's lives and livelihoods. So we're angry when women don't feel safe at night or in the streets or in their homes. And we hate the impact that it has on our town centres. And we want to right those injustices. Unlike the Conservatives, we believe in active government. We believe in high quality public services. And we want more police, but we will expect higher standards from, from them and will work in partnership with other government departments and agencies. <coughs> and we believe in those core Peel principles on which our British policing model was founded nearly 200 ago, years ago, a model for which we should be proud, that the purpose of policing is to prevent crime and disorder, to uphold the law, pursue justice for victims, and keep communities safe and strong. Policing by consent, where the police are the public and the public are the police. So Keir Starmer, as head of the Crown Prosecution Service, prosecuted serious criminals and terrorists, stood up for victims and their families, and time and again he's shown leadership in upholding the rule of law. For 25 years, I've worked on different aspects of crime, justice, public safety, national security from the very first briefings I ever received from MI5 and MI6 as a member of the Intelligence and Security Committee a quarter of a century ago through to being a courts minister and shadow home secretary and select committee chair. So Kieran and I have both seen the challenges the Home Office face, but we know how much more it could be doing to serve our country now. So Labour will bring in new reforms to policing to rebuild confidence and help tackle some of those persistent challenges we face. Reintroducing new work on crime prevention and policing standards into the Home Office. Most urgently, we will introduce new mandatory requirements on vetting, standards, training and misconduct underpinned by new legislation. It means new leadership from a Labour Home Office to set out active strategies in vital areas, including on violence against women and girls, on fraud, on youth violence and on antisocial behaviour. And we will work not just with the police and criminal justice system, but with councils, community groups, businesses, the NHS, schools and the voluntary sector. And it means right, reforms right across the criminal justice system so more criminals can be charged and punished while more victims get justice. And yes, serious leadership too on overhauling technology so the police can use modern equipment and proper collaboration and procure, on procurement and efficiency across 43 forces. We'll develop a proper national workforce strategy too to support the police but also raise standards. And at the heart of our plans on crime and policing, we'll be rebuilding and renewing the neighbourhood police who are at the heart of our communities and the fight against crime. And I want to conclude by saying a bit about why Labour is making this such a priority as part of our reforms. Over the last 13 years, we've seen policing become a reactive crisis response service instead of proactive and problem solving. Only 12% of officers are in neighbourhood policing now, compared to 19% in 2010. 6,000 neighbourhood police and more than 8,000 PCSOs have gone since 2015 alone. But the real figures are worse than that, because even where teams have stayed in place, they're often covering bigger areas, they're merging with response teams, and officers are routinely abstracted from those neighbourhood teams to cover elsewhere, sometimes for months at a time. The people who were the eyes and ears of policing in communities have gone, and the people who solved local problems are too often not there. Neighbourhood policing is always the thing that gets squeezed when everything else is overstretched. It's why the town centre patrols have gone, and why half the country say they never see the police on patrol anymore, a proportion that has doubled since the Conservatives came to power. But you can't rebuild trust in policing without rebuilding neighbourhood police. You can't build the relationships that generate intelligence, that helps catch offenders or crack down on local crime if no one knows who to talk to. Neighbourhood policing shouldn't be seen as a Cinderella service. It should be the building block on which the rest of policing is based. Not left to the edges of policing, but protected and prioritised. And there's a good reason why Sir Mark Rowley, the new Met Commissioner, has made neighbourhood policing a critical part of his plan to restore trust in London. 
In Yorkshire, my constituency and across the coal fields after the miners' strike, we saw p c confidence in policing collapse. But it was the neighbourhood policing introduced under a Labour government that rebuilt that confidence again. So that is why Labour will put 13,000 more neighbourhood police and officers and PCSOs back on Britain's streets, paid for with £360 million delivered from our shared procurement plan. We will introduce new neighbourhood police guarantee, restoring patrols back to town centres, making sure communities and residents know who to turn to when things go wrong, with new statutory responsibilities on forces to protect and deliver neighbourhood policing. So yes, bringing officers and PCSOs back into our town centres, bringing them back into our communities to work on knife crime, back into neighbourhood teams working to keep the streets safe for women at night and restoring those officers and teams to pick up that vital intelligence to catch dangerous criminals. Drawing on the traditional core of British policing, the bobby on the beat, but modernised for a new age, equipped with new training and technology so they can use data to target hotspots, react quickly and build partnerships to solve problems. Across the country through the years, I've met inspiring neighbourhood officers and PCSOs doing incredible work. The officer who I spoke to was working with troubled primary school children to stop them going off the rails, and he knew whose dad was in prison. He knew whose mum had been a victim of domestic abuse. He knew the problems those kids faced, but also what was needed to turn things round. The PCSO who worked with domestic abuse victims, their port of call when they were afraid. Catherine Kaywood may be fiction, but the stories of police officers like Catherine who know their communities, who pick up the things that everyone else misses, who solve pro crimes and keep people safe are all very real and we need more of them. So preventing crime, keeping people safe, punishing criminals who wreck lives so victims get justice, protecting communities from the blight that drags everyone down and upholding respect for the law that underpins our democracy. These are the things that Labour will do. 30 years ago this year, the Labour Shadow Home Secretary, Tony Blair, said, our party will be tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime. It was right then, it's right now, it's what we did then, it's what we'll do again. Over 13 years, the Conservatives have let communities down. Only Labour is the party of law and order now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yvette. Now, we'll take some questions first from broadcasters. We have a raving mic in the room. Please say uh, your name and where you're from. Then I'll take some questions that have come through online, and then we'll go back to questions in the room. So, Maddie, do you want to start with Ben Wright here from the BBC? Thanks. Uh, morning, Hannah. Morning, Yvette. Um, just two questions, please. The, f the first, you talked about the policing system being very overstretched right now, but want to recruit train, pay 13,000 new community officers through efficiency savings, rejigging cash from elsewhere in the system. Is that really plausible? And what impact is that going to have on, on broader policing? Secondly, one force obviously under scrutiny right now is Lancashire Police. How concerned are you about how they've handled the, the disappearance of Nicola Bully, particularly their statement yesterday where they talked about her struggles with alcohol and the menopause? Thanks. So, first of all, we, we have set out very clear proposals for 13,000 additional police officers and PCSOs into neighbourhood teams. We've set out a programme of savings from shared procurement programme, £360 million, that would pay for the additional officers that need to be recruited. And that's based on work on the savings that can be made across police forces. They currently all have different procurement systems around technology, around cars, around equipment, all of those kinds of things. And actually our figure is a very cautious estimate compared to the police foundation work who estimated that double the level of savings could be made from that shared work, but we will make it mandatory to share services and procurement in that way, which is something that the government has failed to do. So that's why we're confident that savings can be made, but we will put those savings back into the neighbourhood policing that we need. The mix of police officers and also PCSOs and specials as well, but 
fundamentally getting 13,000 additional boots on the ground in those community teams working with communities to prevent, tackle, and crack down on crime. And we believe that actually will help policing. So uh, Lord Stevens, John Stevens, former Metropolitan Police Commissioner, who uh, championed neighbourhood policing under the last Labour government. He uh, did a report for the Labour Party back in 2013-2014, which argued that the real risk was that policing was going to become more and more reactive instead of being proactive, instead of tackling problems. That's what I think we've seen happen. We've seen policing increasingly overstretched because they've been forced into the reactive response and not enough is being done to target demand, to deal with the demands on policing, for example, on mental health, but also to give them the technology and work with them to help them move, work more effectively rather than coping with bureaucracy and to make sure that that proactive policing is in place. On the, the issue about um, Lancashire Police, look, Lancashire Police have obviously had discussions with Nicola Bully's family and I don't know what those discussions are and I don't know what discussions <coughs> have taken place and I'm very respectful of that. Obviously, I think there are concerns because the information that, that they set out was very unusual for them to do so, and I would want to know more from uh, Lancashire Police about the reasons for doing this. I do think the most important thing right now is to support Nicola's family and also to support the ongoing investigation so that they can find out what has happened. Thank you. Could we get a Nick Martin from Sky, please? Hello, good morning. Um, just an extra question on the costing. It costs about forty to sixty thousand pounds to train a police officer. Notwithstanding, some of those will be community police officers. It seems like that the sums actually do not add up there. And is this a, a sort of guarantee that if this, if these thirteen off, thirteen thousand officers did come into play, then you wouldn't have to find the extra money by taxing or cutting services. And just another question on uh, how you propose to pay for those extra officers. It's an awful lot of money to, to find through getting police forces to work better together. And I wonder whether this reopens up the debate about how many police forces we have. 43 in England and Wales, we've seen it work in Scotland. What's Labour's view? about that debate on is it time now to start merging police forces in England and Wales to make things a bit more efficient? So firstly on the costings, what we set out is 13,000 more boots on the ground. Of those, we would ring fence 3,000 officers from the additional, from the uplift that the Conservatives have promised. We would ring fence 3,000 of those officers to go into neighbourhood teams because at the moment they're not. At the moment, even though the Conservatives have talked about reversing their cuts, it's not going into neighbourhood policing. And that's the point about needing to be proactive, not reactive. We would recruit then a further 3,000 police officers on top of that, swiftly on top of that, and 4,000 PCSOs as well. And then also recruit another 3,000 specials too. So we've always been very clear that this is about mixed teams with mixed different kinds of experience to be part of those neighbourhood teams, but that's also how you make neighbourhood teams more effective. The £360 million we have estimated from the savings is actually a very cautious estimate based on a lot of the work that's been done by procurement experts. I've spoken to Blue Light Commercial who've talked to me about how little forces are signing up, for example, in many areas to savings that they could be making and there's a whole range of areas where they absolutely could be cutting down on waste and making those savings in practice and as I said the police foundation's estimate was in fact that uh, the savings would be well over 600 million pounds from these kinds of programs so our estimate is a very cautious one we're very clear though that that was what makes the difference in getting those police officers back on the beat using every penny well of public money spending money well being clear that everything we announce will be costed and paid for and that will make the difference on the issue around the, the forces, we think you can move very quickly to just get much better coordination between them and to have those uh, partnership workings in place, but to make them mandatory rather than just voluntary and it, it really be quite chaotic, to have much more coordination and collaboration. We did set out, or Lord John G. Stevens did set out as part of the independent policing review that he did uh, into policing, um, various proposals for reform in 2013-14. Some of the things have moved on on those areas since then. And so what we're doing is looking with, um, uh, the, with chief constables and former chief constables at some of the areas and themes 
that, and looking at those again. But what he was arguing for then um, it was that process of collaboration between forces rather than the, the top-down process. Thank you. Can we go to Peter Cardwell from Talk TV? Uh, well, Talk TV, uh, thank you very much indeed for that very interesting speech. Um, in terms of the 13,000 neighbourhood police officers, obviously you've broken that down in terms of numbers, but still per officer you're looking at £27,500, and that £360 million, can you just illuminate that in terms of is that just in one year, or is that across every year that those savings will be made? Also, secondly, uh, if it's all right, um, in terms of Jeremy Corbyn's, uh, the decision by Keir Starmer to exclude uh, Jeremy Corbyn, Corbyn from standing from the Labour Party. He's called that an attack on democracy. Some of his allies have gone further and called Keir Starmer a hypocrite and a liar. What do you make of those comments? So on the, the costings, we can uh, set out further detail for you, but the 360 million, that is the full year cost. That's a full year's worth of savings. So it's, you know, obviously you make savings each year from making those changes. And bear in mind as well, the different costs around training for police officers and PCSOs that we've taken all into account and the existing budget that the government has already set out for the uplift too. So taking all of those things into account, that's why we're very clear that the sums add up and are, allow us to deliver the big increase to neighbourhood policing whilst making sure that every penny is well spent, that making sure that we make the savings that we need in order to pay for it. On the, um, the issue, look, it's, it, Keir Starmer was really clear about this that we, he was going to tackle the stain of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. He was going to be clear that Labour has changed. And those big changes have taken place since 2019. He's also been very clear with everyone what standards had to be met and on everyone who wants to stand as a Labour candidate to be a Labour MP on what standards needed to be met. And he's making sure that that happens. And I pay tribute to Keir's leadership in doing that. The Labour Party has changed. We've come a long way in a short period of time to be, in, in Keir's words, the party of patriotism, the party of equality, but also, crucially, the party that plans to be in government. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to some questions that are coming in online from the public. Um, and then we'll come to some questions from the room. So you, you spoke, it about having tougher national mandatory standards to tackle the problem, uh, problems of culture and standards in police forces. Can you say a bit more about what specific problems that would be to tackle and, and how that would actually achieve the sorts of changes you're talking about? Yeah, so obviously the really awful cases of David Carrick and Wayne Cousins have illuminated the failures in vetting standards, monitoring misconduct systems. And I think one of the most truly shocking examples of all was in, um, uh, in July 2021, when a complaint and allegations were made of rape against David Carrick. That was a few months after the awful murder of Sarah Everard. It was at a time when the Met Police and all police forces were saying that they were raising standards, that they were taking action, and yet David Carrick was not even suspended. He was not suspended at that time for a rape allegation. And I just find that truly shocking. And what is clear is that the, the requirements on police forces are too hit and miss. It's, gives forces too much flexibility on some of those basic things that should be followed. So, yes, we would have, we would introduce mandatory vetting standards that all police forces have to follow. There's too much ability for them to undercut or to reduce vetting standards at the moment. We would also have much stronger procedures around misconduct as well. For example, making it a, a requirement that facing officers who face investigation for rape or domestic abuse allegations should be suspended uh, and uh, to have wider reforms around training as well. So we are working with policing experts and with former chief constables on what the detail of what those reforms would be, but we think those need to be underpinned in primary legislation. Because I think the problem is, this is letting down victims, but it's also letting down hardworking police officers, you know, who are doing incredible jobs in many forces across the country. So that would be a priority in terms of yeah. the legislative programme. I've had a number of questions in about charge rates. You've talked about the historic lows of charge rates, um, and obviously that's particularly acute for rape and sexual assault. Um, and you've talked about, if you were to get into government, how you would aim to, to increase those rates. 
can you say a little bit about how you would do that, but also about how you would uh, work through the knock-on effects in the system of if that was successful, um, and, and, and how you would not uh, create other problems within the system by doing that? Yeah. So. We, this, this really about, sometimes is a bit about the whole system and the, the way it works. And Steve Reed is working on what needs to be done across the court system to speed things up, including, for example, on having fast track rape course at, at courts to deal with some of the serious issues there. But the, uh, there are obviously a whole series of problems now in the processes between policing and prosecutors. The, some of the issues that the officers who talked about the redaction problems that they are facing now that is just not being dealt with uh, and is causing additional layers of, of bureaucracy or time being spent in order to lay charges. Some of the delays, we've lost CPS Direct, we've lost a lot of those direct connections between the police and prosecutors. So what we are doing is is um, Emily Thornbury, Steve Reed, and I are working together with, again, with uh, former chief constables, prosecutors, and others on what that system should look like in order to speed those processes up and make it easier to lay charges rather than ending up with officers burdened by so much bureaucracy that they end up not laying charges at all. Thank you. Um, if you became Home Secretary, you'd be inheriting a department which is uh, in the process of implementing a transformation program uh, in, the, in the wake of the Windrush, Windrush scandal. Do you think ministers and civil servants have been doing enough to address the problems that were identified? And do you specifically think that the problems that that program is tackling are the right ones? Or do you think there were deeper uh, issues around the structure of the Home Office and its responsibilities, which you would want to think about? So I think there, there are problems that I was alluding to earlier about um, areas of work within the Home Office having been either downgraded or almost abandoned altogether. So some of those areas where um, it's the things that uh, police forces can't do alone. It's the areas where you need either national leadership around policing or you need national partnerships with other government departments. So some of those areas I think have uh, been lost. That includes, I mean, look, when we were in government, we had a lot of that cross depart departmental working was immensely important. I was a short start minister for many years and we had a cross departmental uh, committee that worked very closely, particularly to hold the health and education department together on working on tackling this. I think a lot of that cross government working has been lost. I would like to see that return and a home office that is outward looking towards the rest of government as well as towards communities across the country. The Windrush scandal was devastating. It's terrible what happened to British citizens, to lawful residents, and the way in which they were treated by the Home Office and the bunker mentality that the Home Office got into at that time. And some of the things that are really important was about the, the Home Office being responsive enough to criticisms, recognizing criticisms and being able to respond rather than just putting up barriers and refusing to shift. And that is a culture change. So some of this is about structures and partnerships and so on. Some of it is also about a culture change. I think look, Wendy Williams was clear that said that not enough was being done to implement her recommendations. And we need to see, I hope, stronger action in order to implement those. And I think there's probably quite a lot of civil servants in the Home Office who would really like to see those changes take place and would like to be part of that. I mean, some people have argued that uh, it doesn't make sense for immigration to be actually one of the Home Office's responsibilities and that that would be better dealt with and better able to take a broader view if it was a separate department. What do you make of that? So I think, you, there's, look, there's always different mixes, isn't there? Um, and some of the issues around um, border security are also about asylum and also affect uh, immigration issues as well. So there are always links and overlaps and... Uh, therefore, I think the, um, you know, seeing that as being a, uh, is the issue the problem as the back structure of the Home Office? And I think actually the, ish, the real problems in these areas have been about Conservative government policies, and it's those policies that ought to change. Okay, we're going to take some questions from the room now. Can we begin with uh, Jessica Elgert from The Guardian, please? Just wait for the um, mic. 
Thanks so much, Hannah. Hi, Yvette. Um, I wonder if you think that the, me- the faith in the Metropolitan Police can be restored just by reform alone. And if there, is, if there are further scandals in the police, would a Labour government consider abolishing the Metropolitan Police in the same way that the, uh, it happened in Northern Ireland with the PSNI, in order to kind of restructure and reform the organisation and, and create a new institution that had held public trust? Those are obviously different circumstances because with PSNI there was a particular recruitment issue about the need to have the recruitment across the communities um, in Northern Ireland. So there's a particular reason around that. We are very clear that confidence in the Metropolitan Police has to be restored. I think the work that Mark Rowley and Lynn Owens are doing is really important. And it's significant, the things that they have prioritised. So they've prioritised raising standards and being very uh, sort of thorough and determined about going after other cases where standards may not have been met and where abuse may have taken place. And that means we would expect to see more of those cases coming to light. Other forces, I think, need to do the same as that um, as well, because this is not just about the Met. The second thing I think that's significant is the focus on neighbourhood policing and going back to that neighbourhood policing and having, I think Mark Rose's words were, more more neighbourhood police officers than they've had ever before. That's focus as well. And the third, interestingly, is around technology and the use of new technology where policing is hugely out of date. We do expect to see those reforms implemented, but I think the further questions for us specifically about the Met will be around what (coughs) Louise Casey's review reveals. So we will wait, I think, to see what that um, sets out as to see what further reforms might be needed. But I do just say, I think, although the Met has had particular issues, there are wider issues around making sure that we deal with standards and with confidence in all police forces. And that's why you need home office leadership, not just the work that uh, is happening in London. Thank you. Do you have Jack Elson from The Sun? Thank you very much. Um, you talked about ways about how we can um, root out appalling cases like uh, David Carrick and Wayne Cousins. Can you give us just some specific examples about how you would strengthen those tests when it comes to vetting to stop these police officers ever uh, becoming part of the force? So at the moment, there's, uh, it, it's possible for police officers to get through the whole stages of the recruitment without ever being interviewed in person and without having employment references checked or character references checked. That's not good enough. This is policing. There are much more robust checks on people for all kinds of different jobs than there are for one of the most important jobs that there is. The social media checks that take place. There are cases where uh, forces have found actually there were some quite troubling um, things being said by uh, a potential officer or by a candidate in, on the social media. And instead of taking that as an indication of something that might be of concern and might be a reason not to recruit someone, fine, go get another job, maybe all sorts of other jobs you'd be great at doing, but not to be a police officer. That is not taken seriously enough and it was also just dismissed as part of the recruitment process. So I think there are proper checks that should be being done, proper standards that should be being met, and also proper training, you know, a much stronger process of training around making sure those standards are met, and then having standards then um, in, if, if allegations or concerns are raised, the point I said earlier about, you know, if you've got an officer facing a rape allegation um, or a domestic abuse allegation that's being investigated by their force, they should be suspended. And I've seen cases, for example, where of someone who was a police officer who um, faced domestic abuse allegations, the police force took it sufficiently seriously that they took that case to court. They took that officer to court for prosecution. But throughout that time, the officer was not suspended. I just don't think that is good enough. And so that's why I think you have to have stronger mandatory standards in place. I'm going to start taking questions in pairs now just to make sure we can get through enough. So can I go to the Times and then to PA? Is Matt here from the Times? No? Okay, straight to PA then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, So after your announcement today, Home Office Minister Chris Philber said that Labour's proposed investment is a tenth of what the Tories are delivering. And also you mentioned the 20,000 police officers. I wanted to ask you what you say to that. And then my second question. Can I, sorry, uh, can I just have one question? Okay. We've got a lot to get through. Thank you. That's right. Could we go to the Daily Mirror? 
No, nope. okay, in which case, Daily Telegraph? No. Nope. Uh, okay, then the I, is Chloe here from the I? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chloe Chaplin from the I. Just wanted to touch on something that you mentioned earlier. Do you think under this Home Office there's been too much political capital and time and money spent on tackling immigration at the expense of tackling crime? And do you think that they've misinterpreted what voters really care more about? And also I wondered if you could set a bit of a timeline out for these policies. Um, so I'll start with the, um, the Conservative ministers. I mean, seriously, they, you know, all they are doing is belatedly trying to reverse the cuts that they made, the 20,000 cuts that they made to policing. And that is still, even despite them doing that, it's still not restoring neighbourhood policing. So our proposals are on top of the government's reversing of cuts. Our proposals go much further. And we're talking about rebuilding and renewing neighbourhood policing. Because the problem is, even where they've tried to reverse the damage that they did, it's still not restoring neighbourhood policing. It's still not getting the neighbourhood teams. And that's this stark fact about only 12% of police officers are now in neighbourhood teams. It was 19, 20% in 2010. And that's been a big shift in the kind of, in the way in which policing operates. It is more of the reactive policing that we've seen. I understand there's reasons for that around some of the growing mental health demand, which is why that should be tackled as well. But I just, you know, I think the Conservatives have, you know, they have done huge damage to confidence in policing, to confidence in the criminal justice system, and they have just stood back. While all this has happened, they have stood back while the charge rates have plummeted. They've stood back while victims are being denied justice. We still haven't got a victim's bill, and they've stood back while more criminals are getting off. I think they are really weak on crime and its causes. And you know, I don't think many people take seriously what Chris Philp is saying. Uh, other question was about uh, the folks. So in the, in the end, the Home Office, look, all of these issues are important. And they should be able to do both. They should be able to have a focus around crime policing and also on issues around immigration. Um, the, the issues around the boat crossings, the boat crossings are dangerous and are putting lives at risk. So that has to be uh, an issue that the Home Office makes an important priority. Again, it comes back to that broader responsibility that the Home Office has around security and public safety. Those are the things that we should focus on. Um, I um, actually would also see more focus around some of the national security issues as well. I think those are important too. Thank you. Have we got uh, someone here from the FT? Thank you. Uh, Robert Wright from the AFT. Um, clearly, it's going to be far easier for you to implement some of these policies if you've got a secure majority. And some people are suggesting that developments in Scotland with the resignation of the First Minister could be a step towards uh, your, uh, to make it far easier for you to get a, a substantial majority at the coming general election. Uh, I'm just wondering what you would say about that. Um, I think I would probably first say that um, I recognise the the long period of time that Nicola Sturgeon has given in public service terms and, and pay tribute to that, wish her well for the future. But I do also hope that this is a reset moment for Scottish politics and that the focus can now be, rather than always being around separation, rather than going around the same arguments again and again, can be instead around the issues of the cost of living crisis, the state of the National Health Service under the SNP in Scotland, um, the problems in uh, schools in Scotland. Those are the issues that Anasawa and Scottish Labour have been raising and highlighting. And I think that the work Anas and others have been doing has been rebuilding support in Scotland. We're working really hard to focus on those sorts of issues and what Labour can do um, to help people across Scotland on those crucial issues. Just something like the energy price freeze, those sorts of things as well. Thank you. Do we have Jessica from City AM? No, in which case I'd like to take a question that's come through from a civil servant online. Um, who says, I've worked in a few private offices, the civil service isn't perfect, but gets a lot of blame when ministers do not know how to pull levers effectively. How should the Home Office change to deliver better? So, um, 
the, I think there have obviously been uh, quite a lot of changes in the way that government departments work um, compared to 13 years ago. Um, but I think um, uh, my experience always of working with civil servants was the number of dedicated people working immensely hard and you know, doing their best to deliver the priorities of the minister of the day. Um, I think there's been a damaging tendency over the last few years for Conservative ministers to almost want to try and ignore the facts and ignore evidence. That puts civil servants often in a very difficult position. And uh, you have to respect the evidence, and that is the approach we would take to be very evidence-based in um, our way of working. I do also think that there's um, issues. Some of this is about uh, ministers being very clear about what the priorities are. That is, I know the approach that Keir would take um, uh, leading a Labour government, and it's also the approach that I would take as a Labour Home Secretary. So part of that is about the priorities and purpose for the department, but it's also about that cross-government working that I don't see any real evidence of compared to the kinds of <coughs> programmes and partnerships that we used to have in place. And when I talked about active government before and active government working in partnership, this is not just about crime and policing. This is a, a philosophy for Labour, because if you listen to Johnny Reynolds talking about Labour's industrial policy, it's the same thing that he's talking about in terms of getting economic growth and working in partnership with business, in partnership with trade unions, in partnership with organisations across the country. So the government does its bit, but in partnership, rather than government trying to do everything or rather than government just walking away. It's the same approach on crime and policing and home affairs as well. I wanted to dig into that idea a bit, actually, because almost by definition, the Home Office is the department which tends to be most reactive, most having to respond to crises. So how does this active government approach work? How, how do you get ahead of the sorts of problems which tend to crop up in the Home Office? Well, sorry, for example, in policing, if part of the problem is over 13 years, the technology that the police use has fallen further and further behind. Leaving that process to 43 forces to coordinate has not worked. It has not delivered them the kinds of technology that they need. And Dennis O'Connor, when he was the chief inspector um, of policing some years ago, said to me, you know, when he'd started work as a, uh, as a copper in the 1970s, he said, look, we've been policing, we were ahead of the game. We had the best technology going. We had far better technology than communities, than criminals, because they had the police radio systems in place. Now, and he said that this, you know, nearly a decade ago, he said now the police are being left behind. That gap has got even further now over the last 10 years. But where's the leadership been from the Home Office around something like that? Where's the leadership been on workforce strategies and making sure you have the skills in the modern workforce? And that's why I mean, I suppose, about in the end, the Home Office has to take some responsibility. If public services are going wrong, you might want them to be doing this on their own. But if they are not, if it is not happening, you have to take some responsibility as a Conservative Home Secretary. Suella Bradman has totally failed to do that, but so have her predecessors. And that's why I think this is about a Conservative philosophy of government and an approach, not just individual failure and incompetence. Thank you. I think we've got time for a couple more questions in the room. Muddy, the gentleman at the back with the glasses. Uh, Tom Windsor, formerly of the Inspectorate. Are your proposals not a wee bit modest? Um, 13,000 pairs of brutes on the ground, uh, divided by three shifts is 4,300. Divided by 43 forces is 100 more per force on average. Would the money not be better spent on the investment in technology? You make the points powerfully. I've done the same, as you know. Um, the National Crime Agency has some superb technology, and yet they only have three or four people working on it. And if they had more investment, they could do far, far more. And that technology could be uh, shared with all the other police forces. It doesn't just have to be serious and organized crime. You made the point that you can have new legislation on standards, but you don't need it. Under Section 53A, sorry to be technical, you already have that power. You could set those standards on the first day. Standards on pretty much anything, including vetting, but also neighborhood policing and many other things. Those are my observations. My question is, 
with the Home Office leaning in more, and the current set of ministers use that phrase too, are you going to respect the operational independence of the police? So I think, Tom, there were four questions <laughs> there. Um, uh, so I, um, uh, I agree with you that on standards, there are things that the Home Secretary can do straight away. So there are some areas where you would actually be able to make changes rapidly. We also think that primary legislation would help as well to underpin it. But I do agree with you, there are some things where you can also just directly mandate things and make certain changes immediately, as well as having, I think it does need now, a new standards framework that should be properly legislated for and properly underpinned as well, so that it doesn't become a sort of ad hoc process of a Home Secretary using powers in an ad hoc way. I think better to have something systematic to underpin it. Um, secondly, on the, um, the technology versus people things, there is clearly far more that can be done and far more that can be done in terms of effective technology. That is a mix of both partly around the coordination of technology, partly around the introduction of new technology, and partly around making sure that officers have the skills to use the technology. And that includes some of that will be about staff as well, because some of that is not just about the work officers need to do. It's about the data analysis and, and those sorts of things to properly get you know, hotspot-led policing or different kinds of targeted and evidence-driven uh, issues. On the, the, the approach to the neighbourhood policing, though, I would say just two things. First of all, I don't think technology is a substitute for people and for building relationships. And that's the most important thing about neighborhood policing, that it does differently to other areas of policing. It's about building the relationships. The PCSO I spoke to in Milton Keynes yesterday, you know, just has, he's been in that same area of Milton Keynes for 15 years and has built up huge relationships with local people about where the problems are, about the things that go wrong, about the things that need to be done to put things right. And that kind of intelligence and that kind of confidence that those relationships build is immensely important. The proposals we put forward will mean in many areas actually about 50% increase in the level of neighborhood policing that they have currently got. So you're right that services have been very stretched, but this still is a very significant increase in neighborhood policing. And we're also talking about having the, the kind of guarantee in place um, that underpins it as well. In terms of the operational independence, absolutely. Operational independence is immensely important when it comes to dealing with individual cases. That is a matter for the police. They have to take the decisions about the investigations that are needed and so on. And that also means about recognizing the different demands on public safety that they have to take decisions on as well. But you know, coordination of a computer system that means that the, you know, the CPS who cover a range of different police forces can't even use the same technology systems for the whole of the CPS region because each police force has got a different system for communicating on the files. Now that is just bonkers. And so it really should be possible to have um, that proper coordination and to insist that police forces do that and not to think that, frankly, the having their own particular set of software or their own particular computer is somehow significant to operational independence, because it's not. It's actually about operational effectiveness for all forces working together. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. So will you join me in thanking Yvette for a very content-rich uh, an interesting uh, speech today. Thank you. And just a, a quick reminder, the live stream will be on our website in the next uh, few days. Thank you very much to everyone for joining us. And if you would like to join us for our next public event, that will be on the 23rd of February and will be on the spring budget and pressures on public services. So do join us for that. <laughs>